This week on the Back Table Podcast. We have really been able to accomplish a lot in the last couple of years with the help of these technologies. But the one thing that I think we have to realize is that this epidemic of diabetes and unfortunately people who continue to smoke, CLI is going up. It's not going down. And we have to remember that CLTI patients who undergo a major amputation have about a 45% mortality rate at 12 months. And it's still shocking and depressing to me that upwards of 70% of patients who have a major amputation never received an attempt at revascularization. That's criminal. And we have to educate our patients that they need to be aggressive in their care. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Backtable podcast. If you're a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all previous episodes of the podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, backtable.com. Very easy to remember. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a review, or reach out to us on social media. If you guys let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for our medical community, we're going to do our best to make that happen. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. The Hawk One directional atherectomy system treats all plaque morphologies, including severe calcium above and below the knee. If your treatment goal is to make a small channel or to maximize luminal gain, choose Hawk One to preserve a patient's native vessel and keep future treatment options open. Risks may include, but are not limited to, arterial perforation or dissection, embolism or arterial thrombosis, and vascular complications that could require surgical repair. Learn more about Hawk One as well as risk and safety information at medtronic.com slash Hawk One. Now, back to the episode. Today, we're going to be discussing peripheral arterial disease, specifically below the knee interventions. To help us with this topic today, we have Dr. Peter Soukas. Peter, glad to have you on the show, man. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your background and your practice? Sure. My name is Peter Soukas. I'm here in Providence, Rhode Island. I am currently the Director of Vascular Medicine and the Interventional Peripheral Vascular Lab, as well as the Director of the Vascular and Endovascular Medicine Fellowship here at Brown. I started out life as an interventional cardiologist, but my practice is almost exclusively vascular in nature. And I've been in Providence now for about 13 years and very passionate about peripheral arterial disease treatment. And it's a labor of love to take care of these patients who have critical limb ischemia and BTK disease, which of course is going to be our topic for today. I'm currently an associate professor of medicine at the Brown Medical School. And like I said, super excited to be here. So interventional cardiology, that's not doing any more heart caths. You're almost exclusively in the periphery, right? Right. So the only time I do coronary procedures is when I find myself on call. Will you just kind of talk about uh, patients that get referred to you, what like a standard workup would look like, and just some of the legwork that gets done before they hit your table? Yeah. So we obviously like to follow our patients longitudinally. So we see them initially for their consultation. Not uncommon, they'll have had some workup already. And so that's obviously very helpful in terms of getting them worked up more quickly and risk stratified more quickly. But if it's a brand new patient, they haven't had anything done, we pretty much will start off with a good history, physical, ABI, and an arterial duplex. Now, depending, of course, on other mitigating factors, we'll move quickly to CT and occasionally we'll, we'll do MRA if it's a patient, for example, who has normal renal function, but we're suspicious that they have distal disease, then an MRA sometimes is something that we'll order. But by and large, ABI and duplex is kind of our initial kickoff point. And then depending upon their clinical presentation, we may move relatively quickly to angiography and intervention. Segwaying a little bit into like the disease process. So the focus today, just to remind the audience, is going to be below the knee interventions. And can you talk about that in relation to how it's different, the complexity of the disease, you know, as opposed to anything that's above the knee? Obviously, patients who have critical limb-threatening ischemia, not uncommonly, they will have multi-segment disease if they are not diabetics. And our diabetic patient population, which of course continues to expand every year with the pandemic of diabetes globally, 
they typically will have more distal runoff disease. And so that, again, will dictate what their initial workup is, and then we'll um, go from there. And as far as patient presentations for CLI, a lot of what you described seemed like it was a lot in the outpatient setting. Is there any inpatient component to this? Great point. So patients will, unfortunately, sometimes their first touch with the medical community will be in the ER when they've developed a gangrenous toe or they have a painful ulcer or cellulitis, and that's why they finally decide to come in and and have an evaluation. So our hospitalists are excellent and not uncommonly, a lot of those patients will get admitted to the hospital service. They'll get started on IV antibiotics. They'll get some basic films of their feet, and then they'll bring us and the podiatrists on board to start the workup and treatment phase of their care. So the inpatients typically will present a little later in their disease when they've already developed Rutherford class five and six characteristics. And so those patients obviously get green-lighted, as it were, in terms of getting on the schedule, getting their tests all done. But the outpatient folks, typically, they will present with severe claudication that then progresses to rest pain or the beginnings of a superficial wound. And that's when they get referred from our outpatient referral patterns and our outpatient providers. And then we try to do the work up as expeditiously and quickly as possible so that we can get them treated as soon as possible. So I'd like to start segueing into room, equipment prep, patient prep, like day of the procedure. Did I miss anything else as far as like something you want to touch on as far as the disease process or the workup that we just didn't hit on? I think that a lot of those uh, points we did touch on. The other important component of that is to really assess that patient in a more global fashion. So again, even though I'm primarily vascular, I do try to think of the patient more globally. So we, of course, are going to take a quick good listen to their carotid arteries, evaluate them for underlying cerebrovascular disease, underlying coronary disease, and importantly, make sure that they're on guideline-directed medical therapy before they leave the hospital. And of course, that means aspirin, statins, making sure that we check a hemoglobin A1C, get them hooked up with our nutritionists and our dietitians and our endocrinologists so that when they leave the hospital, we can approach them with a multifaceted group of people who will hopefully be able to impact the disease process after we've done the acute care while they're still in the hospital. Can you say anything specifically about smoking? Do y'all have anything in place for smoking cessation and to help patients with nicotine addiction? Yeah, that's a terrific question and a very important point. I mean, most of our patients with CLTI are diabetics and then the ones who smoke, that's a really lethal one-two combination. As you know, patients who are diabetic who smoke have a 28-fold likelihood of ending up with an amputation. So smoking cessation is really a very critical component of the education process. So we actually have a smoke cessation program within our network and institution, and we spend a lot of time talking to patients about smoking and why it's so important for them to stop. And I think it's incumbent on any vascular provider, regardless of what your underlying specialty is, is to really be very aggressive with prescribing not only statins and aspirin, but also getting people to stop smoking. And if that means breaking out the prescription pad for Chantix or Wellbutrin or nicotine patch, that has to happen. And so we initiate that therapy for those patients who do end up being admitted. Moving on to day of the procedure. We can talk about uh, room prep or patient prep or both at the same time. I'll, I'll leave it to you, Peter. Sure. So as far as room prep is concerned, patients with CLTI, not uncommonly, we have to get creative with access. And that means we may have to be doing retrograde pedal access. We may be doing antegrade common femoral access. So it's really important that the entire leg is prepped and ready to go. And not uncommonly, patients will have two different access sites, you know, one retrograde, perhaps a retrograde femoral coming up and over in order to deliver the larger board devices and definitive therapy. But we also want to make sure that we have the foot prepped so that if we're going to cross a long total occlusion, as you know, it's uh, commonly easier to cross a CTO retrograde, especially using the CTOP classification if it looks like on initial angiography, that a retrograde approach might be easier than 
then by all means, we'll go ahead and just get that access right out of the gates, knowing that we can oftentimes cross that just using a small, say a 0.018 inch support catheter and a 0.014 or a 0.018 inch wire, cross that retrograde and then exteriorize or snare that wire and then deliver therapy from above. And that's something that we do very commonly in this patient population. So making sure that all the access sites are ready to go so that we can move freely from one access site to the other is really important. And it really does help the workflow in the lab as well. Not to belabor it, is there any room for radial approaches in how you guys treat? Yeah, that's a great point. So the uh, R2P movement is slowly taking hold. I think the vendors who make that equipment were hoping it'd be a little bit more uh, widely utilized. But as interventional cardiologists, we do most of our procedures, coronary procedures from the wrist. So we're very, very comfortable doing that. But obviously the disease location plays a major role in whether or not R2P is something that we will utilize. So one of the great things about doing it is for patients who have hostile groins or who are morbidly obese, who've had prior endarterectomies where it's just a scarred mess, then R2P can be really terrific, especially if it's a patient who's got a bad back, bad COPD, or if they're at high risk from bleeding complications from the access itself. So these are all patients who could be done from the wrist. The limitations, though, of the radial approach, as you know, is that you're pretty much restricted to a six French system, and you wouldn't be using it for someone who's got an iliac occlusion where you would have a tough time being able to respond to a perforation. So if we're treating the iliac common femoral or the proximal to mid SFA, we can do that fairly reliably with the current devices. But what we're really lacking is having devices that are long enough to reach from the wrist. And so we have orbital atherectomy and Medtronic now has a long 018 platform impact balloon that can reach. The Mizago stent is something that has a long shaft length that you could place. But for those of us who like to do a lot of drug-coated balloons and drug-coated stents, if you want to use intravascular lithotripsy, there are limitations currently in terms of the devices being long enough to reach from an R2P approach. So it is something that we think about. And I think as the vendors start giving us more and more equipment that can reach from the wrist, I'm sure that we'll be using it more and more often moving forward in the future. All right. So we've talked about access site. So you got the whole leg prepped, radial plus or minus. So be ready to go anti-grade, go pedal. You've already mentioned that some of these often they're easier to cross via pedal approach. How often do you go in pedal versus how often do you just stay anti-grade and try and cross and stay true lumen via an anti-grade approach? I would have to say that that's uh, sort of a moving target. So every year that goes on, we seem to be doing more and more pedal access. And, and sometimes we'll actually put two pedal access sites in, especially if we're looking at a popliteal occlusion and we think that we might need to, for example, do simultaneous kissing stents to reconstruct a distal popliteal bifurcation. So in that situation, we always are going to have two access sites, usually one from above and one below, but sometimes we'll actually do two from below. If you can't cross through, say, the anterior tibial approach, you'll be like, all right, well, let's get a perineal or a PT approach and see if we have better luck crossing it that way. So I would have to say probably right now about 10 to 20% of the time, we are going retrograde pedal. And if it's a patient who has CLTI, I would say that percentage is probably a little higher still, probably more like a third of the time, we're actually going retrograde pedal. Okay, fair enough. All right. So we've talked about uh, room setup. We talked about patient prep. I mean, we can either pick like the perfect patient or the worst patient, but sometimes it's helpful to create like a patient encounter to work our way through your algorithm of like how you approach below the knee disease. I'll leave it up to you. So as I said, we usually like to deliver therapy from above because even though we're very enamored with the pedal approach, we like to try to keep our footprint in the pedal artery as small as possible. That's especially true if it's the patient's sole runoff vessel to the foot. We want to treat those uh, pedal vessels with tender loving care. 
And so our goal is to basically use the pedal access to cross, but to deliver therapy from above. And so once we accomplish that, we try to get that access out of there. And usually just a couple of minutes of digital manual compression would do it, but otherwise, certainly you can just put a TR band on there or internal balloon hemostasis, whatever it takes to achieve that. And then we like to ideally then get that integrated wire beyond that pedal access site. Uh, so that way, if there is an issue with hemostasis, we can just take care of it with a little internal balloon hemostasis. For the uninitiated, that just means you're running a balloon up across your access site, inflating it until you have hemostasis. So you can either do an external compression, like you said, TR band with a little wristband, or just have the balloon on the inside. Yeah, the other thing that it's, it's probably worth noting is that we try to stay below the calf if we can. So if there is any bleeding, it's not going to result in a compartment syndrome. So if we are doing a high retrograde tibial access, that is a situation where we typically will put in a sheath just to be absolutely sure that we have hemostasis and we're not bleeding around the sheath into the uh, compartment. There's nothing more demoralizing than getting a great intervention and then having to call the vascular surgeon to bail you out because the patient develops a compartment syndrome. The one caveat to the retrograde pedal access is if it's in the calf or if it's a high proximal, then we will usually put a sheath in there and make sure that we have hemostasis before the patient leaves uh, the cath lab. Okay, fair point. All right, so I'll still leave it to you as far as if you want to like create the patient encounter that helps best illustrate like your algorithm to working through below the knee disease, I'll leave it in your hands. Sure. So again, we're going to get that access from above, whether that's an integrate access from the common femoral or an up and over. We're going to take our baseline angiogram, spend a good amount of time looking at that angiogram, and then utilizing the CTOP classification to then plan whether or not we feel like we need to you know, get a retrograde pedal access. And if we think that we might, we're going to go ahead and do that right off the bat. And then that way we can move very quickly and try to do the case as quickly as possible. So real quick though, will you just back up and talk about the CTOP classification system? So the CTOP classification was really popularized by Jihad Mustafa, who is an interventional cardiologist from Grand Rapids, Michigan, and a very experienced and talented CLI operator. So they looked at hundreds of angiograms and the CTOP classification really refers to both the proximal and distal cap configuration, whether that's concave or convex. So basically, you know, we talk about the little nubbin or a little beak. So a CTOP one, for example, is, is the one that we all dream of where the beaks are going in the right direction, the beak from above and the beak from below. So the wire tends to just kind of drill right towards the middle and go through the lesion. And then on the opposite spectrum, of course, is when the caps are going against you instead of with you. And there are a number of excellent references on the CTOP classification. And again, if, for the listeners, Jihad and his colleagues, uh, Fadi Saab, they've published extensively on it. If you just Google CTOP classification, it'll pop up there and some beautiful diagrams that you can look at. And not surprisingly, in the prime registry, that their success rates correlated very much with the CTOP classification. So not surprisingly, a CTOP1 had a much higher likelihood of success versus a CTOP3 or 4. And so that really dictates our approach in terms of whether we're going to go retrograde right off the bat or if we're going to try from above. All right. So you've gotten your angio, you're taking a look around and you're probably doing this intuitively at this point, like looking at a lesion and knowing if it's going to be crossable from above or you're going to have a better success from below. I think that just comes with years of treating these and these patients. But all right, so continue. So angiogram, looking good. So we've gotten our baseline angiograms. And again, super important to make sure you image all the way down to the foot. That's really critical, especially if you're going to be using atherectomy where there's a chance you might have some distal embolization, it's really nice to know and really critical to know what your runoff vessels in the foot look like. So if it's a patient who has multi-segment disease, we usually treat from the top on down. That makes sense, right? We're treating in the direction of blood flow. And so we'll typically open up any inflow disease in the iliac or common femoral or profunda femoris vessels first. And then we'll move on to the superficial femoral and popliteal vessels as well. We try to 
pretty much treat on the way down. I personally like to get all my inflow stuff done before I start tackling my outflow. For the simple reason is that once you open up the inflow disease, not uncommonly when you repeat the angiograms, you'll see a ton of new collaterals and you'll see better visualization and opacification of the popliteal and infrapopliteal vessels. And that may in turn change or alter your treatment plan depending upon what it looks like. I mean, we talk about this concept of, you know, hibernating vessel. And sometimes it's because you just haven't adequately visualized it. So what we'll typically do after we fix the inflow is we'll put a diagnostic catheter down by the knee and repeat the angiograms. And what you thought might have been a 20 centimeter CTO may only be a five centimeter CTO and that there is a little lumen there that you'll be able to take advantage of. So I think that's really important to take good quality angiograms. Now, a lot of these patients typically, of course, will have calcified disease. So in our lab, we're very, very big fans of intravascular lithotripsy. And we think vessel prep is really important, especially if you're trying to avoid putting in an implant. But even if you have decided a priori that you're going to put a stent in, you want to make sure that stent's going to be able to be adequately expanded and not have that dreaded hourglass appearance after you dilate the stent. So we'll typically do our vessel prep we do like to use intravascular ultrasound as well for sizing of vessels and determining what types of devices we want to use. For example, do we want to use atherectomy specifically? Do we need to use a calcium modifying technology? And so we'll go ahead, fix all of our inflow before we then go down and try to fix the outflow of the popliteal and the infrapopliteal vessels. So all the descriptions so far, as far as like intravascular lithotripsy, using IVUS, all this, this is all to address still the inflow. Like we still haven't gotten to the below the knee disease, correct? Right. Okay. And not to say that there won't be some overlap, but I just wanted to differentiate for the audience. So this is still fixing iliac lesions, fempop, anything that's still above the knee, right? Right. So once we've successfully completed our inflow treatment, however, we decide to accomplish that. Now we finally arrive to the challenging part of the case, which is usually the below knee vessels, right? Hold on, are you staging these out though? Like, are you trying to do it all in a single session or sometime? It just depends. In our practice, it depends principally on what kind of jeopardy the limb is in. So if it's a patient who is a Rutherford five or a six, we're going to try really hard to get inline flow to the foot and to try to get that wound healed as quickly as possible. We all know from our clinical experience that even just a couple of weeks, unfortunately, these lesions can progress rather dramatically. So if it's a patient who has more advanced disease, we're gonna try really hard to at least get one vessel inline flow to the foot, ideally to the targeted angiosome that supplies that wound. All right. So now some of the easy lifting, all the chip shots are out of the way. You've gotten all the disease from above the pop and the popliteal handled. Now the heavy lifting starts. Right. And so there are now a number of technologies that have really made this in both acutely as well as in the short term, improved our outcomes. You know, certainly the number one reason for failure is being unable to cross the lesion. So we now have a number of guires that have really, I think, made an important difference in terms of our ability to cross the lesion, because obviously we got to do that first before we can put any technology in there. So I think it's important to have a nice complement of wires. You don't need to have every wire out there, but you need to have a couple from different categories that you feel very comfortable with and you're facile with. I have to confess that I, uh, as my workhorse wire, I really like the uh, Abbott 014 and 018 command wires, both antegrade and retrograde. I uh, especially like the Asahi Mongo wire for below the knee, incredibly steerable. You know, the, the uh, ribbon goes all the way to the tip, so it's very steerable. The other nice thing about that wire is you can knuckle and have a nice tight J when you're trying to, to go through a long occlusion with the help of a support catheter. And that's true coming in the, from the retrograde axis as well. I try very, very hard not to use anything larger than an 018 wire below the knee because, again, the risk of perforation has very ominous consequences below the knee. Sure. So you talked about the command and the Asahi wires. What about crossing catheters? Do you have anything that's kind of your go-to? Yeah. So 
we typically will use the aforementioned wires with some type of a support catheter. Again, 014, 018. And there are various support catheters. I think they're all really quite good. You know, Quick Cross, the Terumo, the Reflow Medical catheters, they're all very nice. And, and uh, especially the ones that are braided can give you that extra support to get through those calcified tibial CTOs. And those catheters are super important. Now, we don't have a lot of dedicated CTO devices for below the knee. And that's probably something for a future podcast, but you know they are coming. But by and large, I would say the overwhelming majority of cases are still done with good old fashioned support catheters and wires to get through the occlusions. Not to get too far into the weeds, because I do want to talk about how you treat and your algorithm for uh, approaching the lesions once you have crossed, but can you talk a little bit about the challenges of crossing? It's as much an art as it is, I think, a science. But you know, in general, I think most of us try to use a low or soft gram tip wire. Again, like a command or a regalia, try to cross with the help of a support catheter and then escalate our wire strategy. You know, my fellows always joke because I use the term escalating wire strategy a lot. So if I can't get through with a nice, simple, soft, safe wire, then I'm going to ratchet it up. And that typically will involve something like an 014 or an 018 halberd wire. And then if it's a very calcified lesion and I really need to drill and I'm trying to stay true lumen, then I'm going to use something like an Estado 20 or an Estado 30 or a Liberty wire in order to, to try to drill through that. Ideally, of course, we want to stay true lumen, but the reality is sometimes that's not possible. And it's never really been dramatically shown in terms of long-term success rates, whether you're true lumen or subintimal, doesn't really seem to make a huge difference below the knee. But obviously, we want to try to stay true lumen so that we can utilize atherectomy devices if we choose to do so. But again, more often than not, I suspect it's probably a combination of where most of the time in the true lumen, sometimes you know, we're subintimal, but what counts is that we get back into the true lumen above the ankle and into the foot. So those are some of the strategies that we use. We'll, we'll start simple, we'll start safe, and then become increasingly more aggressive depending upon our ability to cross. And again, it's perfectly okay if you get stuck to stop from above and say, all right, well, here's, here's an opportunity for us to maybe try to get through the rest of it in a retrograde fashion. And so that's when we'll switch over to the pedal approach. And not uncommonly, I'll be working one wire and my fellow will be working with the other wire. And hopefully between the two of us, you know, we'll be able to get through the occlusion. And sometimes you may have to do a little low pressure balloon inflation or a simultaneous balloon inflation to create a little channel so reverse cart techniques can sometimes allow you to get from the subintimal space back into the true lumen or vice versa. And then once you get the wire cross, now at long last, we're finally ready to treat the lesion. All right. So um, before you treat the lesion, can you kind of talk about the lesion that you're treating? Because there's a lot of different lesions in terms of length, in terms of calcification, and how that impacts how you're going to approach it. Yeah, that's, that's incredibly important. And the importance of lesion length, vessel size, and vessel calcification, I don't think can be overstated. So patients with more advanced CLTI, occlusions are typically the rule, not the exception. And the composition and location of those lesions is going to have a profound impact in terms of my approach. So for example, if something is very, very heavily and densely calcified, I know that plain old balloons are not going to do the trick because there's going to be a high likelihood. I'm not going to get acute luminal result. And if I have to go to high pressures, I'm probably going to have dissections. And so vessel prep and plaque modification, I think, play an incredibly important role. If it's densely calcified and if it's superficial, then I might think about using an orbital atherectomy device, for example, a micro crown if I'm below the knee. But by and large, In terms of safety and in terms of efficacy for calcified lesions, again, I think intravascular lithotripsy is a great adjunct because the perforation and distal embolization rates are so incredibly low. We published a paper not too long ago on our experience in the Disrupt PAD observational study, 1,500 patients, and 
we had over 300 cases that were in the study from below the knee, and the complication rates were virtually zero. So I think that's an incredibly safe and effective treatment. Now, it is a little bit bulky, having said that, to sometimes deliver that balloon. And so we oftentimes will need to prep to try to deliver that balloon. But if the artery is not too terribly calcified, then scoring balloons, I think, are an incredibly helpful adjunct. And I have to say, in our practice, we've used the serenator balloon at this point pretty much exclusively for lesions that are moderately calcified, but not super calcified. And the other thing that I really love about these scoring balloons like the serenator is that you can usually effectively dilate these balloons at low pressure. So the incidence of dissection is, is very low. But the other great thing about them is that they have much lower, in our experience, rates of recoil and significant dissection than, of course, some of the older generation balloons and for plain old balloons. So they really are a very effective and important component of the devices that we use. It's really nice to be able to use low inflation pressures. You have that directed force with fewer complications, less bailout stenting. And again, the lack of significant recoil that you typically see with plain old balloons Honestly, in my opinion, I think they're well worth the extra cost in terms of being able to get not only a, a good acute result, but also a great long-term result. You know, one of the uh, interesting things about the scoring balloons, and again, specifically with the serenator with regards to the uh, study that was published, which was the uh, Prelude BTK study, their clinically driven TLR rate at six months was less than 3% which is extraordinary and much lower than what we saw, for example, with the randomized DCB trials for below the knee. So a simple but effective scoring balloon can really have a, not only a good acute impact, but also in terms of freedom from TLR rate. So we have unfortunately not had great results with DCB below the knee. That's been a little bit of a surprise and a disappointment. I think we can talk about some of the reasons perhaps why that might be the case. But again, in our lab, scoring balloons really play a prominent role. So I wanted to drill down on a couple of things. So you talked about the scoring balloons in the setting of like moderately calcified lesions. Well, first, will you talk a little bit about using the balloon? Is it still like uh, POBA in terms of prolonged low pressure insufflation as long as you get complete effacement of the balloon? I I'm just not familiar with them. I just need a little bit of unpacking as far as like best practices to use it and then... Is that like the definitive treatment or you need to take an angio afterwards and just see where you're at? Yeah. So as is true with PTA below the knee, I think the mantra of low and slow and long and strong perhaps might be the corollary to that as well. So we'll usually initially go up with the serenator to about four atmospheres, kind of just let it sit there for a minute. We'll take a look at it. And then if we have a full balloon inflation, then at that point, you probably can just sit there. And then if there's still a little bit of residual waste in the balloon, we'll just maybe crank it up to about six atmospheres. And I would have to say for most cases, we're able to stop at six. Now, of course, I'm not bashful about going up to eight atmospheres. But again, it takes a while for any balloon to work. And I think a serrating balloon like the serenator works best when you give it adequate time to do the job. The strips on the balloons and these individual serrations are able to effectively kind of cleave into that plaque. And I think that if you do a prolonged inflation and you don't go to super high pressures, you're going to see a lot less recoil. And that's certainly been our experience as well. And I'll try to do at least a two minute, but usually I'll go for like a three minute inflation. And if I'm doing a long segment, I might even go to a five minute inflation because it's been shown with plain old angioplasty that long inflations, less dissections, better acute luminal gain. And that's really the name of the game because we don't have great bailout options below the knee. And so we want to try to avoid a situation where we have a bad dissection that's going to require a scaffold. You also mentioned using this as an adjunct with intravascular lithotripsy. So if you have something that's moderately calcified, you use the scoring balloon, do you then come back with lithotripsy and treat again, or depends on the result that you get from the balloon? 
it depends on the result that we get with the balloon. So if we do a serenade, for example, and we have a less than 30% residual with no flow limiting dissections, at that point, I'll probably take the money and run. But if I don't have adequate expansion, and it's typically due to deep well calcification, then at that point, I'll just follow up with intravascular lithotripsy. We probably use more IVL above the knee than we do below the knee, although we're currently one of the sites involved in the Shockwave BTK trial, which is specifically examining the use of the S4 Shockwave balloon for below the knee patients. And I think we've rolled probably about 16 patients at this point, been very impressed with the results in terms of prevention of recoil and being able to get these things open at low pressures. But we use them both quite frequently below the knee. So if I can pick your brain a little bit, we touched on atherectomy, we touched on DCBs, we touched on uh, the scoring balloon and POBA. Can you kind of back up and just take us through like your general approach when you're looking at lesions about what lesions take you down each avenue to where you're going to start treatment with treatment X and then move on to treatment whatever? Like you said, I know it's more of an art than a science, but, you know, we're just trying to like pick your brain to like give the listeners a clue. You know, how can we get some of that Peter Sukas magic? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of my decision making, quite frankly, Chris, is now becoming more and more predicated on what the lesion looks like with intravascular ultrasound. Listeners may or may not be aware of that what I think is going to become a landmark study from our colleagues down under in Australia, Allen and Puckridge, you know, they published a paper on IVIS guided intervention and they found a significant benefit in terms of IVIS guidance in terms of primary patency at 12 months. And Eric Sosemski published a great paper on over 150,000 Medicare recipients who underwent infrainguinal interventions and found that major adverse limb events were dramatically reduced in patients who had their intervention guided by ultrasound. So we really were very impressed by both of those papers and have tried to incorporate that in our practice. So IVIS, I think, is a great way not only of sizing vessels, but also determining the characteristics of the lesion because that's going to have a profound impact in terms of what device I'm going to ask for next. And you know that other paper from Australia, they changed their treatment pattern 79% of the time based on what they saw by IVIS. So it's really become, I think, an incredibly important adjunct. And if we can do something to reduce the unacceptably high rate of restenosis for below the knee lesions with IVIS, maybe that's something that we should be doing on a more routine basis. So it sounds like IVIS plays a major role, but if I can like push you further, so what might you see on IVIS that would then direct you into the next modality for treatment? Right. So the degree of superficial calcification and deep calcification and the quadrants. We know from Fabrizio Finelli's paper that, you know, if you have four quadrants of calcium, DCB is not going to really have very much of an effect. So if something has extensive superficial calcification, then I might think about using, for example, an orbital atherectomy device. On the other hand, if it's all deep wall, then in all likelihood, I'm probably going to be looking at intravascular lithotripsy because, again, it has the advantage of being able to treat both superficial and deep. Now, on the other hand, if it's not terribly calcified, maybe just moderately so, then that's probably going to be a situation where my vessel prep is going to be a scoring balloon, for example, the serenader. Uh, so the degree of calcification, the number of quadrants of calcification is really going to have a, a very significant impact in terms of what I'm going to use to treat that patient. And vessel sizing as well. So we know, for example, that for proximal tibial vessels, especially those that are three millimeters or greater, if we're going to choose something that's going to give us the best primary patency, we're going to think about using coronary stents, for example. Um, you probably remember that uh, randomized trial of DCB versus DES for below the knee, and DES came out on top. And since we don't have dedicated DCBs in the United States yet, I think that drug eluting stents for more focal, larger lesions can still play a major role, especially if a patient has a dissection after our initial treatment. 
Sure. All right. So moving from like the actual treatment to finish with treatment, I guess one of the things I wanted to touch on is technical success and when you're done with the procedure. And so I have a lot of questions about this, but I'll just open it up and just keep it broad. When are you done with that vessel or treating or the whole case really? So again, the underlying goal of the case will depend on whether it's a Claudican or CLTI. So if it's a patient who's Rutherford 5 or 6, who desperately needs to have good brisk inline flow to the foot to heal a wound and get them out of pain, then I'm not going to stop until I accomplish that goal of inline flow. You know, our podiatry colleagues love to use the word, and I've adopted it now, we want to make sure we have red gold reaching the foot. That blood flow, that beautiful arterial flow down to the foot is so crucial to get that patient out of pain and to get that wound healed. So I'm going to try, and if it takes me five hours, I don't care. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to try to get that inline flow to the foot, ideally to the target angiosome. Now, our enthusiasm for doing that is always tempered by how the patient's doing during the procedure. Are they able to keep still and and how much Versa and fentanyl have we given them? And then, of course, the other limiting factor is the amount of contrast. As you know, most of these patients, a majority of them, in fact, are diabetic, and a lot of those patients have underlying chronic kidney disease. So we're going to have an idea ahead of time about how much dye we're going to feel comfortable giving during that intervention. And sometimes we may have to stage it because we don't want to hurt the kidneys. But if the CKD is not a limiting factor, trying to get at least one vessel inline flow to the foot is really going to be the primary goal. And again, we're not looking for perfection, but ideally I want to try to get a less than 30% residual with a less than a type C residual dissection is fine. If I have good flow, if there's no staining, I have a less than 35% residual stenosis. At that point, I'm going to say, you know what? This is a win. And I'm either going to finish the case right then and there, or I'm going to move on to another vessel if I feel like that patient needs even more blood flow to heal the wound. So that's actually what I really wanted to talk about. Because I think it's easier to know when you're done with a vessel, but to know when you need to tackle additional vessels. And, and so one thing I wanted to back you up and drill down on, can you speak a little bit about the target angiosome and which vessel you decide to open up, especially in terms of if you have a wound? Well, we know both from surgical literature and from prior endovascular literature that if you can provide direct blood flow to the angiosome in question, your limb salvage rate is going to be greater. So I walk into the case with the idea that if someone has a wound on the top of their foot, I'm going to try really hard to open up that anterior tibial artery. On the other hand, if it is a plantar surface wound, I'm going to work really hard to try to get that PT open. And if it involves the heel or if the perineal is kind of a dominant runoff vessel that's then supplying both the PT and AT distributions through the posterior and anterior communicating branches, then I'm going to work like heck to try to get that TP trunk and perineal open. So the location of the wound is really going to play a major role in my decision making in terms of which vessel I'm going to try to get open. Now, in the real world, if you have a 35 centimeter AT occlusion and there's a wound on the foot, but that perineal has got a short discrete lesion and a beautiful anterior communicating branch, then I'm going to open up the perineal. And, and if that anterior communicating branch lights up that dorsalis pedis, then I know I've probably done that patient a favor and that may be enough. Gotcha. Can you speak a little bit about uh, the utility in having a fully open plantar arch, whether that portends like a good prognosis or how important is that for the patient? Should it be available? I guess it's always a balancing act with how hard are you going to work to get it open, but I just wanted you to speak a little bit about the plantar arch and what that means for the patients. Yeah, the plantar arch is absolutely critically important. If you have one vessel runoff, but that one vessel supplies the entire pedal arch, that's all you need to do. You don't need to necessarily you know, go after the other two tibial vessels. And it's been shown in study after study that the status of the outflow vessels and the status of the pedal arch is of paramount importance in terms of 
limb salvage rates and successful wound healing. The other comment I would make about that is that, you know, people have been talking more recently about bad disease and sad disease, which of course stands for big artery disease versus small artery disease. The most challenging subset of patients that we have to deal with are patients who have small artery disease, especially below the ankle. And unfortunately, those patients are going to have a pretty high likelihood of requiring an amputation if they have no outflow in the foot. And for that reason, we will be very aggressive. If there's one vessel that's supplying the arch, we're going to try like heck to get that open. But sometimes that means going down into the foot and dilating the pedal vessels themselves. Now, we know that dilating pedal arch vessels carries a very high likelihood of restenosis, but that may be a price that we have to pay in order to get that patient out of rest pain or to get that wound healed. So we try to be very, very careful, try not to be overly sized with those balloons. Low and slow, again, because there is such a high likelihood of restenosis. But intact pedal arch usually portends a good prognosis in terms of wound healing and limb salvage, but unfortunately the opposite are also true. If you don't have a reasonable arch, then that patient unfortunately is gonna have a higher likelihood of requiring amputation. So before we move on to helpful papers, resources, et cetera, is there anything that I didn't ask about that we should have? I think we pretty much hit up on most of the uh, other points, but I think probably before we, we wrap it up, it's probably worth talking about what's coming down the pike and what I'm excited about. And you know, one of the things that we touched on earlier, Chris, was the sort of disappointing results to date with drug-coated balloons. And I still feel in my heart of hearts that drug-coated technology will play a role below the knee. One of the uh, criticisms that I think legitimately has been leveled against the studies that have been done to date, particularly the randomized trial, was the fact that there was gross disparity from one center to the other in terms of wound care. And the fact that in all likelihood, we were significantly undersizing vessels. Again, IVIS, I think, is going to be a very important potential adjunct to correct that original sin. You know, Francisco uh, Listro, interventional cardiologist from Italy, published on the Debate BTK study, and these were diabetic patients. And his results were way more robust than what we saw in the Impact Deep randomized trial or the BioLux randomized trial. And what Francisco demonstrated was that with IVIS or external ultrasound, the average size balloon that he used was a whole half a millimeter larger than what was used in the randomized study. Again, indicating that we were probably undersized in our technology. So that's, I think, really one important aspect. The other aspect is why did the drug coat of balloons fail? Well, we know that there's more calcium below the knee. So I think that there is some evidence to date. For example, there was a randomized study done of orbital atherectomy and DCB versus PTA and DCB. And it showed that the combination atherectomy DCB arm did better. That obviously suggests that calcium is a barrier to diffusion of drug. And so atherectomy or intravascular lithotripsy or other modalities that could potentially improve the uptake of the drug may improve the results. Reflow Medical has a device which is called the SPUR, which is essentially a temporary stent, which is a nitinol device that has little sort of spikes on it. And these spikes potentially may play a role in terms of not only helping to defeat elastic recoil, but they may also potentially be or an act as a reservoir for a drug that might be delivered. The other thing that we have to talk about is, is there a difference between paclitaxel versus sirolimus? And there are ongoing studies right now, which are somewhat hopeful in terms of maybe sirolimus might be better in terms of uh, primary patency. There is a randomized trial going on right now of paclitaxel versus sirolimus, so I think that potentially will be very helpful. And then, of course, when we do get those nasty dissections and we do need to put in a stent, what about 
stents below the knee, specifically self-expanding stents, which can be used for the mid to distal tibials. Unfortunately, the Saval study ended up being a negative study, but there's another stent made by a company called Micromedical Solutions, and that was evaluated in a study that was published earlier this year called the HEAL study, where they had a 92% patency and freedom from amputation at six months. So I like to think of this as sort of a mini superior, if you will, in that it's a woven night and all, and it can be placed all the way down to the level of the ankle. So there's currently a study that's wrapping up in the United States called the STAND trial, which is evaluating this particular stent for the use of BTK lesions. So I think we'll have some good prospective data on that as well. So for those people who are are somewhat therapeutic nihilists about treating below the knee disease, I would say, hang on a sec, stay tuned, because I think we finally are going to have some newer technologies that are really going to help us move the needle. And then the final point I would make, and this is really going back to a question that you asked a couple of minutes ago, is what's your endpoint with these BTK lesions? How many vessels do you need to get open? And there are, you know, the FlowMet program and Philips also has a perfusion program that they have been working on to figure out how much perfusion have we actually delivered to the foot and the distal bed. So I think these technologies will eventually become incorporated into our workflow and help us to decide when's the procedure done, when is enough enough. And maybe we don't need to necessarily try to get all three arteries open. Maybe we can get away with just one. So these things, I think, are going to all help direct us and hopefully make us a little bit more intelligent about how we treat an individual patient on an individual day. You know, part of that gives me a lot of optimism. And the other part of me is completely overwhelmed with like the amount of devices and tech that's in this space. But it's exciting. I mean, it's one exciting because there's so many things that are around the corner and that the things that we're trying out, it feels not that there's not many frontiers to be conquered, but it feels like right now there's just the wild west of trying to figure out exactly what works best for below the knee and a wide myriad of patient populations and presentations. So very cool stuff. Yeah. I suspect that the combination of optimal vessel prep and drug hopefully will be the holy grail to give us not only a good acute result, with the vessel prep, but hopefully the drug sticks around long enough to prevent restenosis. So I suspect that combination vessel prep and drug technology, whether that's a DCB or whether that's a bioresorbable drug eluding stent, but I think we're going to need to have both components to move the needle and give us a more sustained patency. Awesome. For either trainees or docs that are just getting into this practice, can you recommend a couple of good papers to get them started and put them on the right track? So if they're comfortable with peripheral arterial disease, but like you said, they're kind of nihilist when it comes to below the knee, any papers that could steer them in the right direction? Yeah. So one of the great things about most of the meta-analyses that have been done is that they are treasure troves for bibliography, like virtually any paper that's ever been published is usually going to be somewhere in the references for a meta-analysis. So I think that's a quick and easy way to drill down for our colleagues to, to pick out the more important papers. So as far as below the knee is concerned, specifically for the Serenator, which is a technology that we referenced earlier, the Prelude BTK study is the name of that study. The HEAL registry, which utilizes the micromedical self-expanding stent that was recently published in the last couple of months in one of the uh, European journals, the BTK uh, below the knee study from Francisco Listro that was uh, published in Jack Cardiovascular Interventions three years ago. For historical purposes, I think it's probably reasonable for, for folks to look at the uh, Biolimus and the Impact Deep study. These were the BTK studies that were, that were negative. The Lutonix BTK study, unfortunately, didn't quite meet its endpoint, but that was also recently published. I also referenced the IVL papers, the Disrupt PAD3 observational study, the specific BTK portion. I was uh, honored to present that data at the AMP meeting in 2022. That manuscript uh, will be coming out very shortly as well. But certainly I can send off a bunch of those uh, references and we can share them with our colleagues. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, Peter, 
any stone left unturned? Anything that you wanted to talk about? I feel like we covered the topic pretty well. My final comments really more sort of uh, from a 30,000 foot level. And the fact is that we have really been able to accomplish a lot in the last couple of years with the help of these technologies. But the one thing that I think we have to realize is that this epidemic of diabetes and unfortunately people who continue to smoke, CLI is going up, it's not going down. And we have to remember that CLTI patients who undergo a major amputation have about a 45% mortality rate at 12 months. And it's still shocking and depressing to me that upwards of 70% of patients who have a major amputation never received an attempt at revascularization. That's criminal. And we have to educate our patients that they need to be aggressive in their care. And if someone recommends that they should have a primary amputation, then you know what? They need to get a second opinion. And they need to find a dedicated interventionalist, someone who's passionate about treating CLTI because we can't ethically have this many people having major amputations. So there are a dedicated cadre of people out there who are willing to you know, suck up four or five hours of radiation to try to get a patient's artery open and to try to get them healed. We desperately need to train more interventionalists to specialize in this type of work. And then the final thing I guess that I forgot to mention earlier is we are on the precipice, hopefully in the next month or two of getting approval for the lymph flow system, which our colleagues may know is a uh, system that utilizes uh, or creates a percutaneous deep vein arterialization between a proximal tibial artery and typically the lateral plantar vein. So for patients who truly have no options, either for a distal bypass or for conventional endovascular treatment, lymph flow may represent a way of saving the limb. The uh, PROMISE-2 results were actually just published this week, and we'll throw that in. Dan Clare and Mehdi Shishibor were the primary authors on that paper. So lymph flow, I think, is going to be another technology that potentially may help to save even more limbs and more lives. You know, it's funny that you brought up limb flow. I didn't want to bring up that topic only because I feel like that is a completely, totally different podcast that if you were up for it, Peter, if you have any experience with it, we'd love to have you back on the show. Well, we are going to be one of the sites for Promise 3 starting this year. I haven't had any to date, but I would say if you're going to talk to anybody about limb flow, either Dan Clare and Mehdi Shishibor, they, they were the uh, co-primary investigators. The other person who's done a ton of lymph flow, probably the greatest numbers actually in the US, is uh, Miguel Montero Baker, who's the head of vascular surgery in Houston at Methodist. So Miguel has done a ton of work with lymph flow. And then Stephen Coombe from Singapore probably has the largest global experience. Stephen was the one who first actually started with lymph flow and he published the uh, Alps Registry and then, of course, was one of the investigators for both Promise 1 and Promise 2. So Stephen obviously has a ton of experience with lymph flow as well. But in the United States, I'd say Miguel Montero Baker probably is the highest volume operator. And then, uh, as I said, Mehdi Shishibor and Dan Clare were the co-national PIs for Promise 2. Man, so for Backtable audience, if you guys are interested in hearing more about lymph flow and just so I am totally clear on it, lymph flow is the stenting or like creation of the channel between if you have absolute no flow to the foot, you do a vascular channel between like one of the tibial arteries and a vein that then the vein then will supply the flow to the foot. Right. Typically, you get access through the bottom of the foot into the plantar vein and then direct that wire northward towards the plantar artery and then they have their own device, sort of like an, an outback device, to go from the artery into the vein, and then that, that wire is snared, a balloon, anastomosis is then created, and then uh, self-expanding covered stents are then delivered after the valves have been lysed or cut with the valvulotome, 
the self-expanding stents then basically go from the ankle back up to the arterial anastomosis. And the last stent is usually a tapered stent. So it's kind of a reverse taper. So it's a little smaller in the artery and a little bigger in the vein. And that's essentially how the anastomosis is created. And um, the limb flow, I think, is probably going to be best tailored for those patients who have SAD disease, where the issue is they just don't have good outflow vessels in the foot. All right. I think that's a good place to end it. Peter, thank you for coming on the show. To our audience, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show um, but want more, please check out the show notes of this episode. I anticipate they will be robust. I will get with Peter offline and make sure we include some links to articles that were referenced. And you can find those show notes at www.backtable.com. And remember, the show notes are where you can find links to free CME. So go ahead and hit that green button on the app or the website and get some CME for it. For others interested in supporting the show, like, subscribe, or share this podcast on social media, or feel free to go old school and just tell a colleague or a coworker about it. Old-fashioned word of mouth is very helpful as we continue to build this community. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Back Table Podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Jacob Fleming, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson. And Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang. Administrative support provided by Jim Louis Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 